let's move to our third speaker. And thank you. And welcome to Marco Tibaldini from the University of Bolzano. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Marco. Um, Marco is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Education of the Free University of Bolzano, and he's a member of the board of Clio 92, the Italian Association of History Teachers. In the educational area, he studies disciplinary, disciplinary epistemology applied to disciplinary didactics, while in the historical and archaeological area, he's deepening a study about ancient board games. Today, he will present um, Playing in the Jordan Valley, a close look at the La Truncoli board game. Yes. Please, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. I'm uploading in the common chat uh, a couple of papers. Well, a paper and uh, the PDF of my uh, upcoming presentation. Well, uh, let me see how can I um, show my screen, share my screen with yeah, you. Yeah, please share your screen with everybody. And if you can also turn on your camera, that would be nice. Okay, uh, at the end of the presentation, I, I, I'm going to do it uh, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> for the moment please. I have, uh, I, I prefer to concentrate your attention on the presentation. Well, okay. uh, dear colleagues, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today, at least virtually, uh, even if I would have loved to be there with you in person and to discuss uh, with some of, you, some of you about the topics uh, of your lectures. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, yet vaccinated and I cannot travel abroad, but I assure, and I will explain at the end, uh, I will explain why at the end of my lecture, I assure that I will be there for the next uh, edition. Well, today I would like to give a lecture about the Ludus Latrunculorum, which is one of the most iconic uh, Roman war games. The first mention dates back to the first century before Christ and is included in the treaty De Lingua Latina by Varro. In a chapter in which he, he, he is explaining how to draw a chart for the study of the Latin declination, it's possible to read that two these fourfold spring to set of lines are drawn up. The ones crosswise and the other vertical, uh, as in the regular arrangement on a board on which they play at La Truncoli. And the last mention is contained in the Saturnalia of Macrobius, which dates to the early 5th century. Uh, of course, in between there are several other mentions by uh, different Latin authors like Marshall uh, or also Seneca, uh, or finally even uh, minor authors like uh, Flavius Bopiscus, who tells the story about uh, a character named Proculus, uh, who took uh, this game a little bit too seriously. And you will have the possibility to read the story of Proculus uh, using the PDF of my presentation. This is a very interesting quotation, a very interesting mention. In uh, Pompeii, there was written that Lucium Popidium, Lucifilium, Ampliatum, Edilem, Montanus clients rogat cum latruncularis. So uh, his clients, Montanus, and the players of Latrunculi support Lucius Popidius, uh, Popidium Ampliatus, son of Lucius, as edilem, which means that the player uh, of Latrunculi were taken seriously uh, by the Roman society and differently from the dice player. They didn't suffer and uh, they didn't suffer a social stigma. And I will come back later on this moral implication of board games. Unfortunately, today uh, this writing uh, faded and uh, is now lost. The uh, board game of La Truncoli uh, is depicted on uh, many material uh, uh, evidences, on many items, uh, uh, in which we can see, on which we can see more or less clearly the presence of a grid of lines uh, under the counters. And not all the gaming scenes could be easily addressed to a specific board game, but in general, we have to say that in the Roman period, the representation of gaming activities are quite frequent, and especially on funerary monuments. If we see the provenience of all these funerary monuments, we can understand that uh, uh, board games and playing activity in the Roman world reach a huge geographical scale. And this is one of my favorite, uh, is the funerary relief of uh, Margarita. Marga Margarita, uh, 
was the slave, the serva of Marcus Alius Erma. And uh, on uh, his sarcophagus, he depicted a scene in which uh, he and Margarida were playing at La Troncoli. And uh, uh, there is also the dedication from him uh, to his slave. We find, uh, as we found, uh, boards of uh, the La Troncoli board games uh, all around the Roman Empire. Uh, an example, this one is in Italy, very close to where I live, but there are really many, many, many board games uh, around uh, all the provinces of the Roman Empire, but also outside of the borders of the empire. In example, uh, these uh, pieces of wood has been found uh, in a, a ritual deposit uh, on, in the Lake Vimose in Denmark. It's not sure if you can tell this game, uh, if, you, if you can call this game a La Trunculi board game, because uh, there are too many squares. But the most interesting fact is that on the back side of these wooden pieces, there is another Roman board game. Uh, it's a fact that fits perfectly with a, a statement of Marshall, which speak about a double face uh, board game. This one is in the Petri Museum and uh, is one of the most relevant. It shows the placement of the counters during a match and originally was also painted. And studying uh, the game, we can say that probably the placement wasn't random, but this model has been designed by somebody who knows the rules of the game. So considering this fact, we can say that uh, the Ludus Latronculorum uh, show traces of intercultural exchanges. In fact, Varro informs us about uh, the possible Greek etymology of the name Latronculi, which should come from uh, the name, from the word Latrones, uh, since the Latrones were the mercenaries at the king's side, which was called Latus. Anyway, um, also, uh, Julius Pollux in the second century AD informs us that in fact, an Athenian writer of the fifth century BC wrote a verse in which, uh, which in the meanwhile became obscure. And so uh, Julius Pollux acts as uh, to explain it. And it was written, offspring of Pandion, king of the city with fertile fields. You know which one we men, the dog and the city that, are, that they are playing. And in fact, many other authors quote this fact. Uh, equally, also the paremiographer Zenobius feel the need to explain to his contemporaries the meaning of the expression play the city. To play the city, uh, Cratinus mentioned it in his female runaways. And the city is a kind of a game with counters. It seems that the name has been modified by the counters player, for now are called cases, while once cities. And uh, his colleague Pausanias inform us that the game required 60 counters. And once uh, this assessment entered in the loop of the lexicographers, we find many mention of it uh, in several other lexica, even in the Byzantine times. But starting from the fourth or fifth century AD, uh, it's remarkable that probably in the Greek part of the Roman Empire, this game was no more in use. We don't have evidences related to classical Greece, but fortunately, in the Archaeological Museum of Pella, there is a faience board game which dates to the Hellenistic period. So this was a pre-Roman game. So try, let's try to reconstruct uh, the rules of this game. It's uh, still Julius Pollux, which uh, called the board game Plintion. Uh, with a term which fits perfectly with the fact that the, go, that the board consisted of square. And then he say that the method of the game is that two pieces of the same color capture one of the other color by enclosing it. So probably at the beginning of the match, the board was empty. And after the placement of the counters, a piece orthogonally closed between two enemies was eliminated. I, I, I forgot to update the animation, sorry, <laughs> if it's take too long. Okay. Well, there are many mention of this game in the Latin literature, which tells us also about these mechanics of capturing the pieces. Here is a long text that you can read using my PDF and also in many uh, other text, uh, we can read that where one piece can be lost between two opponents or when a piece between two enemy is lost 
or on the side of the gaming board, uh, the enemy perish within a couple of stones of the opposite color. And also this aspect of the game is remarked also by some uh, Greek uh, text. And in example, Polybius compare Amilcar, the father of Hannibal, to a good player who isolate and surround the enemy forces. Well, the names of the games, of the game, of the pieces of the game. The board is called the city. We have uh, no mention uh, of, uh, of this uh, fact, um, no clear mention in uh, Latin or Greek literature, but it seems that the name given to the board, the city, comes from uh, the plan of, uh, of the Greek cities, uh, the orthogonal plan of the Greek cities, which makes sense, but it's just a, a speculation, a modern speculation. And then, the gaming pieces were called the soldier or also the dogs. All the Greek uh, sources refer to the counters as the dogs. And so the name Latroncoli doesn't seem to be directly derived from a Greek uh, word uh, in, in, op in opposition to what uh, um, Varro said. But uh, uh, an Italian uh, scholar suggested that uh, uh, some uh, Greek word like latron, probably, passed through the Etruscan language and then from the Etruscan to Latin. And this could explain uh, the shiftman, fr shiftman from uh, um, some uh, syllab, some part of the word, uh, and could help to reconstruct perfectly the passage from a language to another. In the Greek uh, homeland, the name given to the counters uh, was also kunes dogs. But uh, the story is a little bit more complicated because, uh, in fact, uh, some uh, Akkadian sources, which date back to the Bronze Age, makes the same, uh, use the same terms in reference to game encounters, despite the fact that in Akkadian the correct term to indicate the counters in a game would have been passu, from which probably came uh, also other uh, words used, used in Near East in reference to board games. In example, the word pais and paisha, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, used in the Talmud to indicate uh, the action to casting by chance or an allotment or distribution of land. The most ancient uh, is a letter written by the king of Mitanni to the Egyptian pharaoh, in which we, we see, we, we can read, two alabaster telanu, which is an unknown word, five silver dogs and five golden dogs of five shekel each. Uh, in fact, uh, the most used ga board game of the period required a set of five counters uh, for, the, for the two players. There is also a new Babylonian um, tablet which refers uh, to a board game and call this board game a pack of, do a pack of dogs. And also uh, an Egyptian papyrus uh, uh, written during the Ptolemaic period and is written in uh, Demotic, we can, we can read on it Setne said, who is uh, one of the characters, I am ready. They place the game before them together with its sounds and they play together. So, uh, considering that the term Iwiw, which means hounds in uh, the Egyptian literature, uh, doesn't uh, appear before the Ptolemaic period, we can uh, think that, is, uh, that it comes from uh, the Greek language. But uh, in, uh, in Akkadian language, uh, already in the Bronze Age, uh, the, the term dog was used, was clearly used to mention, uh, to, to, in reference to gaming pieces. So this fact, uh, this terminology, show a long-term process of cultural stratification and cultural transmission, which uh, involved also uh, the ancient uh, Hebrews. And now we are at, uh, at the very core of my presentation. Uh, in the mm, 19th century, the rabbi Alexander Kohut made, he made the first research about the meaning of uh, uh, about the mention of chess in ancient Hebrew literature. And here is what he found in the Babylonian Talmud and in the medieval commentaries of it. In the Babylonian Talmud, uh, there are many references to the fact that somebody can, uh, can make a note to, the, to a court um, and trying to cheat with the court. And this fact was uh, uh, commonly defined as the one who gave counters and mentally dubbed them coin. 
and Rashi, one of the medieval commentators uh, of this pass, uh, marked aside of the text of the Talmud, Piscusin, with which people play. And also, in another passage of the, in another part of the Talmud, we can read, perhaps he gave him counters and, call and, and called them Susim. And Rashi marked play with wooden counters. I don't know if it's necessary to uh, specify it with you, but Susim were the non-Jewish coin or the coins produced during the revolt of Bar Kochba in uh, the 132 AD. Well, uh, we can see that in the Jewish context uh, was quite usually, usual to play with coins or with something which could be easily taken for coins. But Alexander Kohut uh, went on with his studies. Another passage, shed, uh, another passage of the Talmud shed a new light on the topic. Uh, Rabbi Naman said to Rabbi Anan, when you were at Mar Samuel's Academy, you wasted, you wasted your time playing Iskundra. And then Rashi marked a game play with pieces on a board in the, mid in the yeah, 11th century. And another commentator also earlier marked that uh, Iskundra was a game with little dogs. And in another part of the Talmud, we can read that it makes a difference if she plays with little dogs or spend her time with, with Nardsir. We know that Nardsir or Nardsir was a Persian board game very similar to modern day backgammon and was a gambling game. So uh, it had, it, there was a social stigma about this board game, the Nardsir. And so if the Iskundra was a different board games, it means that it was a game of strategy. Considering all this fact, Ulrich Schedler, who is one of the most prominent scholars that study board games, suggested that the name of the game, Iskundre, which means Alexander, came from Alexander Janneus, who was a Jewish king, lived shortly before the Roman domination, who issued a coin which uh, had uh, such low value and no reference in everyday life, uh, as said also by uh, Akov Meshorer, Yaakov Meshorer, and Schedler thinks that these coins were used also as counters, and from this fact derives both the name of the game, Iskundre, and the Jewish proverb, proverb give counters as money. The fact uh, that uh, this game was in use in, uh, in ancient Palestine, uh, uh, find also, found also some evidences. Uh, on the left side, uh, we can see a board with a, a grid of a square, which fits perfectly with the board game called Polis or Latrunculi in Roman time. And on the right, we can see, and of course, this board has been found in Israel at Maresha. And Adi Ehrlich published uh, a set of gaming uh, materials, astragals, and counters found, which has been found under a tile of an administrative building using Nakenunid and Hellenistic time, and probably quickly evacuated during one of the frequent wars that occurred in the region, and has been found in Tel Kedesh. So uh, this game entered in the Hebrew context, probably during the Hellenistic time. I've said earlier that this game is no more in use. I am wrong because this game is still in use in the circle of classic, uh, classical studies. So there are many people that play, no, not so many, <laughs> some people that play these board games during the, the, the conference of classical studies. Well, and uh, I'm very uh, thanks, to, very thankful to you for your attention. And uh, here in the PDF of my presentation, you can find uh, uh, the bibliography that I used to, used to produce this uh, speech and also a suggested bibliography. Well, um, my presentation uh, is over and now I can uh, turn on my camera. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in conclusion, I would like to say um, that I decided to give this lecture uh, at this conference and I submitted uh, already the last year. At first, because uh, my friend Agai suggested me. And uh, uh, secondarily, because uh, I'm a member of a group which is called Board Game Studies Society. It's a group of scholars from many universities that studies ancient board games. And uh, Israel, um, the, the, yeah, geographically, Israel, and also culturally and historically has a crucial role, but it's very difficult uh, 
for us, uh, since I don't speak, I cannot read uh, ancient uh, Hebrew text, it's very difficult to get uh, into uh, that uh, context. So it um, would have been nice for me to be there with you, to meet you, to speak with you, uh, also to think about uh, further cooperation and uh, just to say you that uh, if your excavation or your studies, if you find some gaming material, uh, there is this uh, very high level conference in which you could present your findings. And there are for sure many experts, many museum directors, many scholars who will be interested in know uh, what, uh, what you found. Uh, I aim to give also other literature lectures uh, in the next years about uh, other games which were in use in the Jordan Valley during the Hebrew times, uh, following uh, the Roman conquest or also during the Bronze Age. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Very lovely presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Do we have some questions for Marco? Please, David. I have one question, which was the quote you had from Pompey, that the, the so-and-so's client and the players of La Truncoli support him for Idil. Um, uh, it looked to me like that was something that was put up by his opponent. Um, it is not something that, that shows that playing La Truncoli was, uh, was a, an honorable thing, but on the contrary, who supports him? His client and the, and the game players, those are the people who support him. Uh, do you think that's possible? No, uh, but thank you for the question, David. Uh, I, I don't think that is the case because uh, this writing was marked outside of the house of Montanus and was uh, in an official position. So it wasn't marked, uh, it wasn't scratched, it was professionally written uh, near the entrance of the home and uh, um, we have also plenty of uh, literary, li literary quotation about uh, um, people who tried to um, obstacle the election of other people, but they uh, always make reference to dice player. In example, in Cicero, in Cicerone, uh, there, is a, there are a lot of mention of uh, the dice player who support Antonius or who support Catilina. And uh, I will give a, present, uh, a lecture about this fact uh, the next year because uh, Israel played a very crucial role in the spreading of uh, the uh, actual cubic dice. And I will speak also about this uh, connection, uh, moral connection between cubic dice and uh, uh, moral depravity. But thank you for the question, David. Thank you. Do we have some other questions? Yes, uh, it's not a question, it's a remark. Uh, I believe you are familiar with uh, Michael Saban from the Israel Antiquities Authority, who wrote his PhD dissertation, uh, dissertation about uh, board games. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I will show you up. Thank I've you. never met, um, I, I never had the occasion. Uh, to speak personally, but uh, of course I've read uh, uh, the dissertation and also some other articles. Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> thank you. you. Several articles about. Marco, thank you. thank you. Marco, I do have a question. Why do you think this particular board game, it's so cross-cultural? Why do you think it got so much fortune, you know, throughout times? Uh, okay, because... Uh, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, probably a Greek board game invented by the Greeks uh, and uh, spread uh, in the Mediterranean, Medit in Mediter in the Mediterranean region uh, with the uh, Greek colonies and also with the conquest of Alexander the Great. Um, it was a very particular board game because uh, all the previous board games uh, uh, with a high level of probability, they were also a race game. They were all race games. So this was, uh, uh, as far as we know, the very first uh, uh, strategic board game used in the Mediterranean. And, um, and something then, uh, easy to carry, right? So soldiers course, could carry it around without any... Well, what people difficulty. carried usually were uh, the counters 
the counters, um, the astragals, and the dice. And the board game, we found, not me, not me but in general, the archaeologists found uh, a huge amount of board games scratched on the surface. Uh, in example, uh, on the tile, uh, on the ground tile of a floor, uh, on a tile of the roof, when the roof uh, collapsed, or also there is a mention in Polybius, uh, in which he said that during the conquest of Corinth by the Romans, uh, there was a group of legionaries who took down, a um, not a painting, but a, um, a picture from a wall, uh, a tile picture from a wall, and they started to play uh, drugs on it, and probably um, it was a, a, a picture on which there was a grid of lines uh, in which on which was possible to play at Latroncoli. So it was uh, the very first uh, strategic board games. It was a new kind of board games. It was the board game used by the social elites and uh, probably with the um, colonization and the Hellen Hellenisticization of the Mediterranean, uh, it became very popular and uh, uh, is nowadays probably at the basis of what we, uh, what we call the chessboard. Is the, the look is the very, uh, is similar to the chessboard. Okay, perfect. Thank you thank for your you. question. Thank you. So thank you, Marco, and thank you all the speakers and all the attendees for joining us. So Jonathan, please. <laughs>